Best Book Bits brings you Brant Mensoir, award-winning musician, speaker, core values activist, former rock star, and one of America's top 10 motivational speakers, host of the podcast show Thoughts at Rock, and the author and bestseller, Black Sheep. Brant, welcome to the show. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate you having me. No, no problem. For my audience that don't know the real Brant, um, Mm -hmm. where did it all begin, and how did you get to where you are now? So I spent 20 years in the music business, uh, two different bands, two different record deals. And uh, after 20 years, I sort of needed an exit strategy. I did not want to be, you know, 60 years old touring around the world. And so, um, you know, I, I simply sort of transferred from one platform to the other. I went from from playing festivals and, and concerts to speaking at uh, conferences. And uh, that's sort of what was the sort of journey. I had this uh, this sort of life altering event happen in, in 2012 where my oldest son uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And so that sort of forced me to pivot from what I was doing and really had me dive into the world of defining the things that matter most to you and how do you sort of live your life in alignment with those things. And that's the journey I've been on for the better part of uh, nine years now. Wow. I I didn't know that. I know you were a former rock star for 20 years and Mm. traveling around the world. And I know we briefly spoke before and you said you traveled around Australia as well. Mm -hmm. What what, what type of band was it and what, what did you do in the band? Uh, so I was the I was the lead singer of the band, and um, the first band uh, was called Fort Pastor, and uh, we were uh, half Aussie and and half uh, American, and so we had uh, everything was built around the didgeridoo, and we had a uh, uh, John O'Callo was sort of our our bandmate uh, from Melbourne. Um, and he was uh, just amazing, uh, like a freak of nature uh, to be able to do, you know, like seven things at the same time. <laughs> and um, so he, uh, uh, we, we played for many years and then uh, two of us from that band moved on to form Big Kettle Drum uh, in 2009 and uh, toured for another, gosh, 10 years or so as Big Kettle Drum. But we played sort of Americana music. We were we were in, in many ways sort of Mumford & Sons before before Mumford & Sons um, stole our career. <laughs> and, uh, it was, um, they're amazing and just, uh, they hit it at the, just the right time. But we were doing the sort of suitcase kick drum and, and um, the, the banjo or slide guitar and all, all that sort of stuff, Americana style, style music, but uh, really fell in love with Australia. Uh, had a chance to go and tour there twice and, you know, played uh, most of the, I think, recognizable cities that in some unrecognizable cities that, that people would be familiar with. But we played as all the way up in Townsville, um, all the way, you know, south uh, Canberra, Wollongong. Um, we did Melbourne, Sydney. We did Adelaide. We did Perth. We did um, uh, honestly a little bit of uh, of everything. I think it was twelve different cities uh, that spanned across the entire continent, and so it was like uh, it was fun. We had a, we had a blast. Yeah, and how did you transition into the um, speaking gig and and traveling around the world speaking and speaking to companies like Microsoft, Hilton, uh, Netflix, and things like that too? What was that like? So, you know, once this happened, um, where, uh, you know, I, at that point I was 42 years old and, uh, realized rather abruptly and, and violently that I had no idea what my non-negotiable values were. I had a good idea of the things that were important to me, but I had no idea of the things that I would stand on and not move. And that sort of led me down this path of, not just studying behavioral science in, in that way of how we define those things, um, but also try to come up with a better way uh, for people to go on that journey and have that conversation with themselves to define these things so that they can live uh, their lives on purpose. You know, I think the words on purpose are, are some of the most misused words uh, in the English language. Uh, on purpose, people sort of have a tendency to just believe that means you're being intentional. Uh, But I like to believe that those two words mean you're doing something in alignment with your purpose. And so where does that purpose come from? And, you know, a few years ago, uh, Simon Sinek came out with a book called Start With Why, um, which was a massive success. And um, 
it's partially correct. I, I wish that it had an asterisk uh, on the on the cover of that book because uh, it start with why as long as your why is right. Um, but what I have discovered over the last few years is that um, without exaggeration, 99% of people have no idea what their five non-negotiable values are. Um, if I asked someone, define for me the five things that you simply won't be moved from, tell me why you selected them, give me examples over the course of your life as to why, how I know they're true. Um, they just stare at me uh, you know, with disbelief because they've never taken that journey and done that deep work, uh, which ultimately is where your why comes from. So when you have a purpose, that purpose is chosen by the activation of those non-negotiable values. And so if you have a purpose that does not have those things defined, it's not your purpose, it's somebody else's. Yeah, correct. And you talk about purpose, it's not a mystery, it's a choice. True, true. I, you know, I, if you're like me, you know, you grew up most of your life with people telling you or, or reading that you have to find your purpose. And, and you know, I made it this... In my head, it was like this Indiana Jones quest for the crystal skull. You know, I'm like, I don't want to go on that journey. Um, but uh, in reality, uh, it, it's not, you don't find it, you choose it. And so when you understand that that choice is based in these non negotiables, then, you know, you have an opportunity to get to work and start to live your life um, on purpose, in alignment, and experience a sense of fulfillment that up to that point probably escaped you. Yeah, and you talk to companies about sort of valued uh, values based leadership with organizations as well. I do, you know. So, so the interesting part, um, so the work I do with organizations is really trying to help them create a culture of connection, right? So we have an assessment that we created that went along with the launch of of Black Sheep of the book, and the idea is that when people define their non negotiable values, um, it it actually allows you to start to form some really strong bridges between you know what matters most to individuals to what matters most to the organization and if you don't have those things what you end up doing is handing employees a set of values that aren't theirs and you ask them to adopt them like they're their own and that that just never works and so my work is in making companies understand and teaching them how to rather than handing people a set of values and asking them to adopt we build bridges that allow people to use what matters most to them to amplify what matters most to the organization and when you do that you get much stronger levels of commitment you get six and a half times better resiliency you get six times less turnover you get four times healthier employees you get one and a half times people who will go above and beyond what you ask of them so the you know the results those kpis are there in place but it often gets looked at as a soft skill um, because behavior and values are really difficult to measure yeah yeah perfect and you've, you've got a couple of little things there called uh, rock and roll with it overcoming the challenge uh, of change rock and roll with it how to amp up commitment and create uber fans that you speak of as well uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, creating uber fans that was my first book um, first book was a self-published book that came out uh, three four years ago called rock and roll with it this really sort of dealt with the two types of change that we are faced with um, uh, most of us anyways on a daily basis and that is uh, the first is is the change you want to make uh, and the second is the change you are forced to take and so you know how do you deal with each each side of that um, it's sort of two sides of the same coin but you have to approach them a little bit differently and so you know when we sort of came out with that book myself and and um, one of my best friends, Jim Trick, who is a uh, uber successful life coach up in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Um, you know, we talked about people. How do you deal with with you know the person who wants to lose twenty pounds um, on purpose, <laughs> and then how do you deal with the person whose you know son got diagnosed with cancer? How how do you face those types of change in your life successfully? And that's that's what that book, um, the, the the idea of rock and roll with it is, you know, there are times there there has to be a rock for you to stand on and face these things head on, and then there are going to be times you just got to roll with it and let and let it happen. Yeah, and uh, if if you don't mind, and open it up to us about your your son getting diagnosed with cancer. How old was he at the time when he got diagnosed with cancer? Uh, he was fourteen. 
okay. when, when he was diagnosed, we spent uh, 263 days uh, in the hospital with him battling. Uh, he beat it. And, and, you know, we spent um, nine years with him, you know, recovering and, and continuing to, to fight. And then in uh, February of this year, uh, we lost him to COVID. And so uh, it was just uh, uh, earth shattering, uh, as you can imagine, still here just a few months out. Um, life looks different. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. I had, yeah. I had no idea. Um, so what, what have you been up to since, obviously, after after the death of your son? Have you, are you still working or are you still promoting your book? And Yeah, you know, um, it's an interesting journey, uh, you know, when when you're in the middle of it, when you live in a hospital for a part, you know, the better part of a year and you see the, the, the realities of what pediatric cancer looks like, um, you, you understand, uh, in one way, how lucky you are, uh, and, and in another way, uh, just the, the harsh truth. And so, you know, coming out of it now, after a, a few months, you know, Theo was an artist, um, and actually, uh, created the cover of the book, uh, black sheep. He created the logo, the, the black sheep logo. And that, that is now, you know, inked on my arm and, um, you know, so, so part of it for me now becomes the, the lessons of black sheep were, were born out of his fight. Um, and, uh, in my fight along with him and our family. And, uh, so it's just my job to carry on that legacy. And, you know, this is, these are things that could cripple you, could send you into a very deep, dark place. Um, but I'm trying to uh, uh, not, not sink too far down into that hole. I think it's inevitable to, that you're, you're going to have these dips into there um, every now and then. But um, how do we carry that, that message? How do we carry the, the truth forward and have people who end up having to face something as horrific as this? Um, how do we help them face it? and come through the other side successfully yeah absolutely yeah and you, you talk a lot about the book and i've sort of recently sort of sped through it and gone through it you say you talk about open um open yourself up to to find the real truth and and hitting things hard and take a, a hardcore look at uh, who you are not who you wish to be uh and definitely not who others think you should be as well so um when was when did you actually write the book? Was it, or when did the book come out exactly? So I started um, writing the book in 2019, and uh, in I think it was October uh, of 2019, and the book came out in uh, September of 2020. And so uh, you know my publisher uh, is Page Two out of Vancouver, uh, and they were just, I mean, amazing at sort of standing next to me and, and, you know, walking through sort of what we had experienced up to that point and then, you know, help me crystallize this idea. So I was 42, I was 42, no, I was 40, well, 42 when, when sort of Theo was first going through all these things. Um, but then I was 47 when somebody said to me, uh, do you know why black sheep are really not valued like the rest of the flock by farmers. And, and I just had never heard the actual truth. Um, you know, I, uh, like many others, have just understood black sheep to be outcasts and, and, you know, different and whatever odd or however you wanted to sort of define that. But the truth is that the reason that farmers don't value black sheep the same as the rest of the flock is because a black sheep's wool cannot be dyed. And so every black sheep, in effect, is 100% authentically original. And so when I, when I heard that, it completely shifted my, my feelings of, of what being a black sheep actually means. And that is something we should be running towards, not running from. And I believe we all have this flock of five black sheep values, these, these unchangeable values, no matter how much someone wants to try to influence you or twist you around. They simply will not be moved like a black sheep's wool. And so our job is to define our flock. And so the interesting part is, is as we've created this assessment that, that helps people discover what those are, you know, we've had over 5,000 people take that assessment since September. And, um, you know, the, the interesting data that's come out of that and part of the reason why, um, you know, you read the quote of, of not, you know, be, be who you are, not who you want to be or who somebody thinks you should be is because... What the data showed us is that when you 
come up with your initial flock of five of what you think are your actual non-negotiable values. Um, two or three of them are absolutely 100% authentically true, but two or three of them are not. They are fabricated in some way, shape, or form. And they are fabricated for a couple of reasons. One is um, you are projecting something of who you want to be, um, but not who you actually are. Or number two, you've been conditioned to care for other people's sheep um, some of us for our entire lives. So if you grew up in a family where you had an elderly grandparent or you had to take care of a sibling because you were in a single family household or whatever the circumstance might be, um, you've been conditioned to care for other people's sheep. And when you get older, um, if you don't do the work to separate those things, um, your sheep go unfed. <laughs> and when those values go unfed, uh, it's impossible to live your life on purpose and impossible to experience the fullness of, of living a life of fulfillment um, without doing that work. And so that's what the book helps you do is it helps you separate these things and then help you prove that they are indeed real and not a fabrication of your mind. Yeah, perfect. And what would be like a short process for my audience listening to f <clears throat> uncover their uh, five uh, flock values what what would be the process you would take someone through to discover their five values the book goes through a couple of different ways to do it um the the yep. long road if you will is sort of uh going through what maslow would call your the peak experience over the course of your life um, both good and bad and and sort of sorting through those events and and finding what really came out of those how did it shape you in some way shape or form but that's not um the easiest way it requires an incredible amount of vulnerability and courage and most of us just don't have the time or the willingness to do that um, so we created this online assessment it's free for anyone to go and check it out you can go to uh, findyourblacksheep.com and um, simply click on find my flock and when you do that it basically is going to present you with 125 commonly held personal core values and it's going to uh, say look read through these words quickly and in a knee-jerk reaction if the word resonates with you just go ahead and select it and so what we know after all these people have taken is that the average person selects at least 30 of these values as something that is really important to them and that's the beginning of identifying the real challenge to doing this work, which is when you have 30 plus things that you're telling yourself are incredibly important, um, it makes it virtually impossible for you to focus only on those non-negotiables. So what we do is we take those things that you said were really important and we start to group them together by likeness. So you have five buckets of which you're going to place these words. And so you put them together, things like empathy, sympathy, caring for others. Well, those are all related. We put those in one bucket. Uh, success, achievement, uh, accountability, those all go in another bucket. And before you know it, you have five buckets with all um, sort of filled with very similar words in each one of them. And then you get to pick what's the one word out of those buckets each that is your non-negotiable, the one you can't live without. And that sort of is your, it gets you to your initial flock of five black sheep values. Once you get there, then you have to be able to say, are these real? Do they appear organically in my life without me trying? And so there's a process of tracking these values over the course of two weeks um, where you make some adjustments, you find the ones that are real, you find the ones that aren't. And after two weeks, you should have a fairly decent idea of what's real and what's not. Um, but the, the real full process could take you, you know, three months, six months, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, it just depends on your life and, and your lifestyle and what you're doing. You know, um, people who are in the middle of the, uh, all of us who are in the middle of the pandemic, it makes it really hard at times to experience some of these values when you're stuck in, in lockdown. Um, but uh, once you're out in the world and have a chance to sort of live life as, as normal as possible, you really get an opportunity to prove those things to yourself. And once they're proven, um, you know, one of the things I tell my clients a lot is you only need belief when you don't have proof. And so stop trying to convince yourself to believe something and instead find the proof. And if there's proof, just acknowledge the proof. There's no need to believe. Um, and so that's sort of the work that has to be done to make sure that they're, they're headed in the right direction. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing. And one of the things I liked how you summed up in the book was think uh, of your black sheep as your own personal hit song that connects your head and your heart. Um, that was a really good summation of it too. And one of the great little quotes you put 
uh, in the book as well was the secret to becoming unbreakable is realizing that you already are broken because we all are. Um, expand on that a little bit. A couple of years ago, I came across um, the Japanese philosophy known as Kintsuni. And uh, Kintsuni uh, not only is a, is a ancient uh, Japanese philosophy, but also a, uh, has become a way of fixing broken pottery. And so the legend has it, uh, I think it was in the 1500s, um, there was a, a Japanese shogun um, that uh, had his favorite tea bowl broken. And so he sent the, the bowl out to be repaired and it came back with like staples, metal staples in it. And, and it was just, it wasn't very pretty to look at. And so he was not pleased. And so he gave it to some local artisans and he said, listen, I, I don't care how you fix this, but it's got to look better than this. And so um, rather than try to just put the bowl back together to make it look like it never had gotten broken, they decided to go out and find the most valuable resource they had at their disposal at that time, which was gold. And they melted the gold down and they used the gold to repair the cracks of the of the tea bowl. In doing so, they did two very important things. Number one, um, they actually made the gold more value uh, the bowl more valuable than before it was broken because now it's laced with gold. Um, but number two, they honored the history of the bowl. They told the story of the bowl. And um, you know, a, as I started to do this work in the values space uh, and dealing with a lot of leaders in, in, in very, very powerful companies and very powerful positions. You know, uh, what I found is that most of them um, were doing, you know, arm's length leadership, keeping people at arm's length. They weren't ever letting people truly in. And it's because they were, they were afraid that they would be broken in some way um, by something. And the idea was rather than try to stop yourself from being broken why don't you just acknowledge the fact that you already are and focus on what's holding the brokenness together um, and those those things the, the most valuable resource that you possess um, are those black sheep values and so just like these artisans use gold to repair the cracks you've got to use these values to hold that brokenness together and really help people see a bit of your history and who you are and why you are the way you are yeah, awesome. And what's this about the ACDC method that you speak about when you train? Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, well, obviously coming from co coming from the music world and being a massive ACDC fan, how could I not? But uh, you know, we I sort of came up with this idea of helping people understand. I'd like to have acronyms of some kind that make it easy for people to remember. You know, one of the interesting things about thinking of your values as as hit songs, right? There, there's really only two reasons why a song becomes a hit. Uh, the first is the responsibility of the songwriter, right? And the songwriter has to do something very specific. They have to connect the head and the heart. If you connect the head and the heart, uh, you engage your limbic brain. Your limbic brain is where all of your emotional long-term memory is stored. It's why you remember lyrics to songs written 30 years ago and why you, know, you can't remember a single Justin Bieber lyric from today. Um, if they don't connect your head and your heart, it's really difficult to remember. Okay, so that's step one. Step two is all about frequency. How often is the song heard? And so in the United States, a hit song is played at least 10,000 times a week, right? So you think through 10,000 times a week, which when you break it down, comes out to about once every three to four hours in every market in the US. And so, you know, when I work with organizations and I talk to them about their organizational values, the first thing I have to ask them is, do those values connect the head and the heart? If you tell me that transparency is one of your organizational values, I'm telling you, my heart is not moved by transparency unless unless you connect it for me. So you better write something underneath that word that helps me connect my heart with the, the reason why transparency is so important to you. And then secondly, <clears throat> is that value experienced once every three to four hours at work every day? just like these songs are heard on the radio. If they're not experienced once every three to four hours, they will never become that anthem that you want people to remember. And so <clears throat> sort of in that light, when you start to think through those things, you come back to your own life and your own things as to how you're going to, how are you going to experience these values on a daily basis? If you leave it up to accident or or hoping or wishing that, that 
uh, an opportunity presents itself, you're never going to be able to embrace the fullness of it. So you have to start programming these values into your daily life. You have to go to your calendar. If you looked at my calendar next to every appointment that I have, you would see not just the time and the person and sort of a little bit of what it's about. You would see one or more of my black sheep values written into my calendar. And it's written there because I'm going to speak that value into existence on purpose during that time. And I do that because I have to act with deliberate intention if I want to truly honor these things in the way in which they're meant to be honored. And so I am not going to rely on luck or accidents. I am going to choose to speak those things into existence. So for, for instance, Michael, today, and we knew we had this podcast this morning, um, you look into my calendar and you see not just your name and, and the time, um, but you also see three words. You know, you see creativity, hope, and impact. And the reason you see those three words is because those are the three things that I am speaking into to existence deliberately on purpose during this conversation um, and and if I do that job well then I have I've done the only thing which I have control over which is honor the things that matter most to me with deliberate intention because what happens after this is completely out of my control yeah great so your three values is creativity help and impact what are your other two so um, I, so I, I talk about having a flock of five but you can't spend 20 years as a rock star and not live to excess so i actually have six <laughs> i needed an extra um, so mine are creativity hope impact empathy family and authenticity so every decision i make in my life uh, are filtered through those six things. And the choices I make either honor those things or they violate those things. And so that uh, it makes living your life and making decisions much cleaner um, and simpler than trying to sort through the 30 things you just told yourself earlier were super important that are swirling around you like a tornado. And from your experience uh, being a high performance coach and, and teaching uh, multiple people and being a top 10 uh, speaker in America, mm -hmm. Have you noticed a lot of people have different uh, values in different orders or is there a sort of a mixture? There's no perfect recipe. Um, is there any correlation between between the values of someone else and the values of, of yourself or, or talk to me a little bit about the differences that's in other people's question. values? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So, so, so here's the really interesting thing. While we do have, um, there are shared values, uh, uh, that that show themselves over and over and over again, and I can tell you what those are, and I will. Um, but the the important part that I want people to understand is that even if somebody had the same flock as you, and they had the same identical values that you say you share, um, how you define those values and how you honor those values are what make you completely unique, even if you share values with someone else, and so. Uh, what we know after sort of 5,000 people taking this assessment, the number one shared value among all humans is connection, um, which says a lot. Uh, I think depending on your religious upbringing, um, you experience that within the faith that you, that you um, choose to, to believe. Um, I think we see that a lot uh, especially in this country right now with how divided we are as a country. Um, I believe that division is caused solely by connection. <laughs> um, when people can't find a healthy place to connect, they find an unhealthy place to connect because it's connection that has to be fulfilled. Um, and so when you, when you wonder why the far left or the far right have these massive followings, um, it's because the one thing that, that extremist groups do incredibly well is make you feel connected. They make you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. And so if we want that to change, we have to stop keeping people at arm's distance and we have to start welcoming them uh, into the areas that we want to have discussions, even if those discussions are difficult. Um, so th that's, that's number one. Number two is, is integrity, uh, it's a shared value. And number three is, 
uh, authenticity. And so the interesting thing about those, those values are they're very subjective. Um, what authenticity means to you, I promise you, if we both wrote down a definition, it's, th th there's going to be same but different, right? And so um, part of the work that I do with people is you can tell me whatever you want to tell me is your value, but I force you to define what you mean by it. Because if you don't define it, if you don't know exactly what it is, how do you know what to look for? How do you know if you're honoring it or not? Um, you fall back into winging it. And that's the that's sort of my number one challenge with people is getting them to stop winging it. Uh, it's just easier to wing it. Even people who tell you they're not good at winging it, that's not true. They are absolutely adept at winging it because we are as humans uh, just naturally adept at winging it and so you know for me it's getting people to stop winging it and start living with deliberate intention that are decisions made through these non-negotiable values yeah yeah I agree. I, I agree and another name for connection could be people as well uh, mm -hmm. I realized after you know doing 700 book summaries and researching my book for 13 years and putting all the information together, I realized at the end of the day, it's people that's on top of the pyramid. Everything we do is for people. Someone wants to make more money. It's it's why. It's because yeah. they want more freedom. Why? So they can spend more time with who? People. So mm -hmm. everything equates back to people. So I would change connection for mm -hmm. people. And, and as a as a species and, and humans, we're all, we're all connected. So yeah, I, I definitely agree with uh, connection, integrity, and uh, authenticity as well. Um, I want to make a quick segue to the podcast uh, that you've mm -hmm. done called Thoughts at Rock. When did that start and uh, how's it all going so far? Two years ago, uh, we started Thoughts at Rock, myself and my business partner, uh, Jim Knight. Jim uh, was an executive uh, head of learning and development for Hard Rock International for 21 years. And um, we started... Uh, this podcast uh, was going to be a book uh, that we were writing together. And um, about halfway through, we were like, w why are we doing this? Let's just turn this into a podcast. <laughs> and so we, we decided to go that route instead. And every guest we have, we ask the same question, right? And the same question is, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given and how did it change your life? And so we have had um, you know, famous athletes. We've had astronauts. We've had... Um, you know, news anchors, we've had CEOs, we've had um, everyday people, we've had, you name it, we've had a little bit of everyone over the last two years. Uh, it's a weekly podcast. And um, yeah, so it's it's been a very interesting journey, uh, a chance to, to make some really strong connections and, uh, and hear some just incredible advice from people who uh, are incredibly successful in the in their particular area of choice. Yeah, and that's exactly what I'm doing with yourself and interviewing others as well. Mm. Uh, funny little story, I was interviewing Nick from Book Thinkers uh, recently, yeah. Yeah. and he had your t-shirt on. All right. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Nick is- Which, which was great. He's amazing. You know, um, uh, both Nick and Ryan, who who run Book Thinkers, um, uh, Ryan was just down here in Florida, and, and we had a chance to go to dinner uh, last week, which was a treat. Um, you know, they, they really- um, when, when we released Black Sheep, uh, I did a partnership with them that was more than just uh, promoting the book. We actually did a five-week training uh, that they helped sponsor. And we had, I think, 27 countries represented in this training, uh, uh, hundreds of people. And, and we literally helped people define these things. And, you know, Nick is, is, was one of the ones that we had this aha moment with where, you know, the, the interesting thing um, when you start to define these things and you start to uh, realize if these things show up or not in your life, you know, impact was one that didn't show up for him, that he didn't even select. And what we discovered was that because of who he used to be as a young man and some of the some of the emotional baggage that he carried with him during that time stopped him from selecting something like impact because he felt like the people that he knew at that point in his life would disagree with him. Um, but that's not fair to him <laughs> and it's not fair to him as a, as growing as a human. And so, um, we under, we, we finally got to the truth that impact is actually one of his black sheep values. And it's why book thinkers has been as successful as it is and why they continue to just blow the doors off of the bookstagram community and the work they're doing there. But you know, that's uh, I love, I love being able to meet people 
people who have the tenacity and the hustle. Um, and when you give them some some guidelines and you give them uh, the sandbox to play in and say, do what you're doing, keep that hustle, but do it with this intent, um, then what's possible for them, you know, get, gets 10 x Yeah, absolutely. And um, I love your little merchandise range there with t-shirts, hats. You've even got some uh, shoes and and coffee mugs as well and even a watch. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where can people find your merchandise? Uh, They can can go to wheretheflock, W-E-A-R, wheretheflock.com. Uh, there's lots of merch there that they can find as well. Um, we have some partnerships coming up uh, in the next year with some other brands that we were we are doing limited edition black sheep runs. And so, yeah, well, there's lots of things going on um, behind the scenes right now that are super exciting. And so, uh, we'll we'll see where it all ends up in the next in the next twelve months. But um, could be could be fun. So, what else what else are you working on behind the scenes? Well, there's a potential television show um, that is um, in the works right now that uh, uh, will be a lot of fun. Um, it's called Flock My Life, and uh, it is a yes. You you can laugh at that. I I did as well. I thought I think it's hysterical. Um, <laughs> it's time to get your sheep together, and um, you know that is uh, uh, how we are going to approach this. I think we're gonna. It's sort of like a part part queer eye for the straight guy, and part uh, you know uh, Doctor Phil, and part. Um, you know, fixer upper where we come into someone's life at a crossroads. We help them to find these things that matter most. We bring in an expert to help them um, amplify one of these values in a particular area. And then we take them out on an excursion and teach them how to live these values in real time in their world. And um, so we are sort of in in pre-production for this as to working through what that's going to look like and how it's going to work. So very excited about the potential for that. Who knows if it if it happens or not? You know how these things go in 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 uh, the entertainment world. Everybody's super excited about it, and then it doesn't. It goes away for ten years. So you know it's one of those yeah. being being in the music business for as long as we were. We take everything with a grain of salt. <laughs> but um, you know, so some fun things like that uh, uh, that are happening, and um, you know, it'll be as I said some of the some of the merch stuff. We're working on uh, some potential partnerships with some shoe shoe companies and and some other things as well on a larger scale and and watch a watch company as well uh, on a larger scale. Um, and it's just reminders, right? To me, the reason I have this this uh, uh, sheep head tattooed on my forearm is the reminder that if I'm not leading with the things that matter most to me, then I am not living my life on purpose, and that is uh, unacceptable. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, amazing. And a couple last questions before we sort of wrap up. So this one's a bit of an oddball. If you could host a dinner party with three people, uh, either from the past uh, that are famous, who would they be and what would you serve them? Mm, man. Uh, so if it's dead or alive, I would say Prince has got to be in there. Um, I'm a huge Prince fan. I grew up in the era where he was just king. Um, and... Uh, a musical genius on on so many levels and the 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 tallest shortest man i've ever seen in my life <laughs> his ego made him about a foot taller than he actually was um so he would be one uh second i would say you know um maybe uh russell brand um i find him incredibly fascinating uh, and incredibly intelligent. He's a deep thinker, uh, in spite of the of the silliness. And so, I think we'd have an amazing conversation. And uh, and then I'm going to go way back, and I'm going to say Saint Francis of Assisi. Um, yeah. There have been more books and more movies about Saint Francis than any other human in in history. Um, and there's a reason yeah. for that. <laughs> uh, so for me. Um, there was a book I read many years ago called Chasing Francis. If you've never read it, it is a uh, um, wisdom literature, right? So it's it's a it's a fake story with uh, real facts sort of included about Saint Francis, and um, that book uh, came to me at a very important point in my life and really helped me sort of define my my faith as to how I choose to live it. 
um, and some of the realities of, of facing things that it's not just blind faith. You're allowed to question things and be angry and, you know, ha have difficult conversations. And it's not just, I'm going to believe this because this is what I should do. Um, and so, uh, those would be the three and what I would feed them, um, would be, uh, eggs. <laughs> I, I'm not a good cook. But I can cook me some eggs. I would actually cook the eggs myself. Yeah. I make coconut eggs where I do a little bit of coconut cream and with some eggs and and it's sort of like this this scramble uh, hash uh, bowl that i that I make. and um, we would all we would all sit around and eat some eggs and uh, and have some amazing conversation. Yeah, perfect. Sounds sounds amazing. I'd like to come, by the way. That that would be great. And um, you would be more than welcome. great. and And you were a pastor at one stage as well. is that is that correct? Yeah, six years. I spent six years uh, pastoring a non-denominational non church yeah. in Melbourne, Florida. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I spent my first, the first record deal uh, was in the Christian music market, right? So we toured with all of the sort of, you know, the Toby Max and the Third Days and, and all of these bands that um, now are old. <laughs> but at the time, uh, we, we spent uh, several years with them. And then... Uh, sort of left the Christian market in and into the, the general market with big kettle drum. But, uh, you know, f I did, I pastored a church for six years, I, you know, touring all around the world and playing, you know, some of the biggest churches on the planet, um, from, you know, Hillsong in, in Australia to, you know, Rick Warren's church to Joel Osteen and all, 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 you know, Willow Creek, all these huge churches. Um, we had a chance uh, to see things done really well. We had a chance to see things done really poorly and, uh, and a little bit of, of everything in between both mega churches, tiny churches, you name it. And so I sort of came out of that process with a good idea of what I thought church should be or should look like. And I just couldn't find it anywhere. Um, and so we planted a church and, and started with five families in my living room. And within a year we had about 400 people. And so we had to find a place. <laughs> um, and then, um, so the, the church sort of really started to grow. And then, and then my son Theo was diagnosed, uh, and, uh, and God and I were in a bloody fist fight, uh, for the next, you know, uh, uh nine years. And so I just didn't feel right continuing to pastor the church when I was at odds with what I was feeling and believing. And so, um, I walked away several years ago and, uh, uh, but it was a, it was a beautiful chapter in my life that I am incredibly thankful for. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, where can people find yourself and, and your books online? Uh, brantmenswar.com is the easiest thing to just go there, uh, on, on social media. Everything is at Brant, B-R-A-N-T. Um, Menswar, M-E-N-S-W-A-R, and uh, you'll find me on pretty much any social network uh, that that you're looking at. Yeah, great. And before we go, just one last question: What's the last message you want to leave the people listening and, and watching right now? So you know, listen for me. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all about hope. And uh, one of my favorite singer songwriters is a guy named Foy Vance. Um, Foy is, uh, from Ireland and, um, he has a song called two shades of hope. And it says, uh, if there's one thing that I know, it's that there's two shades of hope. Uh, one is uh, the enlightening soul and the other is more like a hangman's rope. And, you know, I think that we recognize that there are two sides of hope when you hope for something so much and it doesn't happen. It's awful. Um, but the other side is 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 that if you don't have it, what are you what are you holding on to? What is helping you guide your life? What is that thing that makes you want to get up in the morning and and try again? And in the face of incredible um, hardship, um, you know when you lose someone uh, as as five you know on, in this country over five hundred thousand people with COVID and, and worldwide it's we're millions of people now. Um, if you don't get up in the morning uh, and have some hope, you don't get up in the morning. 
And so, you know, no matter what you're facing right now, my word is this, define these things that matter most to you. Don't be distracted by, you know, 30 or 40 things that you tell yourself are important. Define the five that are non-negotiable and get up every morning with deliberate intention and choose to honor those things. And when you do that, you'll find that hope is much closer than you think. Yeah, powerful. Thanks for sharing and we appreciate your time and you coming onto the podcast and um, being so open and honest with us as well. So thanks so much. I'll share this with my audience and appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much, Brant. No worries. Thanks so much. I'll speak to you soon. Bye.